Hello and welcome to this wonderful and insightful conversation in the area of strategic experience elevation. We have all been working towards the main customer. The customer is the epicenter of all our activities and we have been really doing all our activities day in and day out focusing our investments, focusing our strategies, focusing our partnerships, focusing our relationships around all this. And today is the emergence of another great quote unquote technology called as AI, which is become dot AI extension for everything that you do in your day to day life. Any interesting activity that you do, people prefer to put that dot AI and dot IO into their activity and it becomes like as if you have empowered a bullock cart with a rocket engine and trying to make that rocket engine work like a rocket. So we are here to understand how are we strategically elevating the experiences of the customers today and how are we actually are we actually trying to use this AI to the maximum level possible. And how are we going to build the foundation to make sure that this strategic activity of AI is going to really make sense to the industry? So with me, I have some wonderful luminaries here and we are talking about strategic experience elevation, dot, 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 affordably, because ultimately affordability is something that we are all looking at. May I start with Jay Chandran? Jay Chandran, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Baba. Thanks a lot for you know, inviting for me this uh, discussion. Um, I work in Stan Chartered as a head of engineering for a digital products section. My name is Vinod. I head the data science and analytics for South Indian Bank. Hi, uh, I'm Keshav. I manage digital banking at Yes Bank. Um, I mean, it's been over two years. And before that, I was with FIS managing the banking implementations for a quite a long time. Hi, uh, my name is Vishal. I work as a head of IT for a company called Western Capital Advisors Private Limited. It's a five-year-old company and majorly the company is into is an NBFC and majorly uh, prior to this, it was majorly into providing loans, MSME loans. Now we've just recently folded into retail uh, space with the brand name as Prabhav Loans. So my job is to spearhead the entire uh, IT division for that brand. Good evening to all and thanks, Babu. I am uh, I'm Mangesh Mahale. Currently, I am a CTO in Ujjwal Small Finance Bank. Glad to be meeting all. Um, good afternoon. My name is Aroj. I head the banking and financial services business for Couchbase in India. Uh, thanks, Babu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Arijit. Uh, presently, I am working at DBS Bank as a, a data marketing uh, analytics and data science field. Uh, we majorly work for few markets in Asian markets, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, Indonesia. Uh, for all these markets, we are doing uh, marketing, analytics, smart tech, as well as data science. So that's a uh, brief about my role. Hi, Anish here. I work as a principal solutions architect for Asia Pacific at Couchbase. First of all, welcome to this interesting conversation. Let me start off with the first fundamental question around Seamless customer experience. This is nothing new. We have been working around channel integration. We have working around various other activities to remove the silos of information. Ultimately, whenever uh, you know uh, we speak about seamless customer experience, uh, we speak about integrating across all the data silos. And then we speak about uh, having AI built on top of it to give that uh, seamless experience. And today is the time of humanization of this information or uh, experience to the customer as close as it can happen to the requirement that the human beings have. So when we are talking about all this, what are the key underlying elements that we can see uh, which make a lot of impact or which, which really needs to be looked into? And how are organizations today focusing their investments to achieve this? Uh, what proportion is put in which element most of the time so that it gives you a maximization? And it may differ between an NBFC, between an insurance and between a banking. So I would be happy to start with uh, Arijit uh, on this. Arijit, uh, can you just share some thoughts? 
Yeah, thanks for the question, Babu. So yeah, there are, I'll say, uh, various uh, examples of seamless customer experience through AI, but the uh, one that I've chosen for this uh, today is basically customer journey. Okay, so um, any good bank has uh, more than 200 plus or 300 plus customer journeys across their products. So be it credit card, be it investment, be it insurance, uh, debit card, all of these products, there are 300 plus journeys for any full-fledged bank, right? So often what we have observed is that though customers are coming to our digital channels, may, maybe through app, maybe through Digibank, maybe through website, etc. But there are broken journeys, right? They are trying to understand something. Uh, they are trying to uh, read about something or, or uh, trying to understand a product and then see the features, then try to uptake the product or try to get the product's uh, details. But then uh, they are not able to complete their whole journey from starting from understanding to say, take up of a product. And the, the journeys are broken in between and they are frustrated. They are not getting the answer and then probably they are leaving. They are trying another another ways, other, other ways, other banks. So, so what we have done, so this is the basically the business problem. Then what we have understood. So we have understood this has multi multifaceted this is a multifaceted problem it's not only that customers there are broken journeys customers are coming they are not able to find the proper link proper pages next pages next action call to action but there are also traffic and other stuffs right at various stages which is hampering the total uh, you know customers uh, experience okay so we have implemented bots right ai bots which will automatically log into these various products. Uh, we have 300 plus journeys, as I said, right? So we they those bots will automatically log in, try to go to next page, next thing, what, what the call to action, what is the next page? So all of those, the bot will, we have defined and designed the bot in a such a way that it will complete a journey from starting to log in to end uh, of, the, of that or taking a product or leaving a note saying that I would like to know more uh, a, a call is expected or something like that. So, so we have introduced bots which will log in and which will go end of the journey and report it out to us where the journeys are breaking or whether the journeys are fully completed, right? And from that data, that data we are trying to identify uh, the the I'll say uh, relations of between journeys, right? It's not only one journey. I, I can come for a credit card, but I then say something is good for on the investment side or insurance side or some other product. I jump quickly from credit card to that, right? As a customer. So the bot, bot is capturing all of this and reporting it out in a, in a manner which we are analyzing through data science and trying to fix those journeys for customer. So that has improved the customer journey. I will say there are previously, um, and this creates a negative customer impact, right? So our negative in customer impact score was higher. We have reduced that to 60% less through these board journeys. It is still in developing. It is not completed. But yeah, we are seeing the benefit already. Interesting perspective. And the bots are also getting quite intelligent now with AI and humanization happening in the bots uh, journey for the organization. What I have also realized when I talk to people is the integration across the various uh, silos. Today, organizations are working on uh, different data silos. Okay, integration, the more you integrate, the more you make it seamless, the more better is the journey is what many people have been telling me. And uh, to that extent, it also makes a lot more interesting from the business perspective to see how you can break these silos. Keshav, do you have any other thoughts uh, than what, uh, you know, uh, Arijit has mentioned? When we talk about seamless humanization and seamless humanized experiences, I think uh, fundamentally there's a, uh, there are two elements to it. One, which is the customer facing element, which I think Arijit has already covered where uh, we have a viewpoint on how we want to represent it to the customer. The second element is the backend piece where you make the data ready, you make the whole engagement ready to be given to the uh, front facing applications. Now, uh, seamless experience using AI uh, in the market, what we are uh, experimenting right now, I wouldn't say we are on, we are all in POC stages, most of us. What we have been doing is we are trying to see how to personalize the experience for the customer. When, mm -hmm. when we talk about personalization, we are talking about data and what we are living with right now is a legacy data which we are using for modeling. 
and then we are trying to bring an omni-channel integration on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what is being dovetailed into the AI chatbots and AI virtual assistants. And then we are looking at those journey, wherever the journey breaks are there, we want to uh, uh, rather rectify it. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is still a modeling process. This is still a work in prog uh, progress kind of a stuff, which is with most of the banks. We are working with AI to as a POC rather than as a very conclusive action at this point of time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a small difference between the robotic process automations that we are doing versus the actual AI implementations that we plan to do in future. So bringing a seamless humanized experience is will is an evolving journey at this point of time with the technologies that we are dealing with. Yeah. Uh, we are trying to make, we are also trying to compete with the fintechs who are moving very fast on that aspect. But as a legacy bank with a lot of governance, with a lot of information security aspects, a lot of regulatory aspects, we have to be very cautious of what we are doing. So the one element which actually curtails all of this is the investment focus around this area because advanced AI and machine learning uh, seamless experiences that we talk about to the, uh, to the customer comes with data analytics and data analytics and processing takes a lot of uh, what you call uh, power and computing power and other pieces and that customer journey analytics the kind of um, integration into the back end the legacy platforms and getting a common data uh, what you call mapping which need, which can dovetail into the future kind of applications all of those and the training pieces all of those need a lot of budgeting and a lot of uh, implementations Super. Uh, just gentlemen, for my understanding, does this uh, differentiate between B2B or the corporate banking and the, uh, you know, uh, and the, uh, you know, retail, retail banks? Is there a difference between both of it? Anybody has any thoughts on that? One thing I can share, though I represent, basically, I work for a consumer banking group or retail banking. Uh, I think these journeys are more, I think, at least maybe 10 to 20 folds more in retail than the corporate banking than B2B spaces. So broken identifying broken journeys and rectifying those are more important for retail than the B2B. B2B space people generally prefer to talk to some uh, you know, account management manager, right? And, mm -hmm. and then try to find out what is possible, what is not possible. But uh, B2C spaces, generally many people, uh, multiple millions of people log in daily basis to uh, digital channels. So there are the broken journeys are more. That's a very good thing and everyone has been working throughout 365 days around this customer journeys and experiences. Uh, if I just go uh, into, into the back door and try to see what is behind these journeys and what is behind the integration of these silos, I would like to know from uh, Anish, uh, what has been your experience around uh, putting these elements together and what are those critical elements that really make a difference? You would have uh, to do yourself, yeah. So I, I'm I'm actually excited about a couple of uh, points that Arijit mentioned and Keshav mentioned. Arijit was mentioning about like 300 customer journeys where they have bots going through different silos to see if the journey is uh, continuous, if the experience is seamless. And second thing that Keshav mentioned was the budget. So, or the amount of investment that is required to get this up. So both are actually, uh, so you have a target to achieve through uh, integrating AI or the, uh, seamlessly making the customer journeys uh, good. Uh, whereas there is a bottleneck of the amount of investment needed to custom do it. Uh, one major thing as much as I've seen in the banking sector is the, uh, the, are the tools that or the applications that are required in the banking, which cannot be replaced easily. The core banking systems cannot be replaced that easily from a banking uh, perspective. And uh, the other new services or new features which come in are not part of the core banking. They are in different silos as uh, you have to, but then you have to integrate all of them together to even get a picture of the customer. So getting all those together and having that picture is the primary uh, step to create a customer journey or understanding the customer a lot more in a single perspective. And any service, any uh, background system that you create to improve the customer perspective needs this customer profile to be built. And that's what Kesha was mentioning. So 
the perception that you have on the customer the okay he might be a credit card customer but he might have taken a couple of loans so that combination might be a percentage of the customer of uh, who has actually bought a credit card so the the segmentation becomes much more important when you integrate all these together and it's more targeted it's more valid for uh, to see that uh, the validity of seeing a customer through by integrating all this becomes much more uh, uh, real and much more related to the actual reality so Excellent. A typical customer profile or a customer 360 picture, painting it together or bringing them together becomes imperative in a banking, especially because of the poor banking systems and the other major systems which can't be replaced. Uh, that in, brings uh, me to my second question, actually, Anish, uh, is the legacy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the bigger banks are actually saddled with a lot of legacy. We are talking about, you know, the rocket engine. This is a bullock cart trying to fix both of them together and make it fly like a rocket. Okay, when you try to do both these elements together, uh, maybe I would first start with some of the bankers first as to how we can actually integrate or what are their experiences in integrating a bank like South Indian Bank has a legacy, for example. So, uh, Vinod, from your perspective, how have you seen this legacy integration becoming uh, important? And maybe Jay Chandran can also take it off from there. Uh, legacy into uh, you know transformation into the digital journeys uh, how has it been absolutely and i think that's a very pertinent question to ask because you know that's the transformation that we have kind of embarked on not too long in the past see i think there are two or three things uh, you know which are important here one is it's important to realize that uh, you know, there is a wealth of data sitting in the legacy systems i mean south indian bank is a 92 year old bank the customer base are the loyal customers who have been with us for maybe 30, 40, 50 years. And so there's a whole lot of data which may not be captured in that level of maturity that we are able to capture now. But there's a lot of intrinsic insights which is actually embedded in those legacy systems. The, 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 the challenge is how do you incorporate that into a data, so to speak, structured or unstructured when we go for the digitization? Second thing is, there is also a whole lot of garbage sitting out there, so to speak. I mean, when I'm talking of garbage, I'm talking of the data, which has got very little va value. I mean, it is not really too relevant. And therefore, there's a temptation to ensure that whatever, uh, you know, transformations you're making, you get 100% of whatever data you've got and then try to add on, right? And that is not really going to solve the issue in terms of the challenges that a modern bank is going to face. So I think that is where uh, having some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 new eyes, a pair of eyes looking into the data and trying to really, uh, you know, come up with a set of, uh, information that we, uh, you know, that's felt is very much valuable and needs to be kind of uh, utilized. And then looking at the gaps in terms of both the data and also in terms of the systems to capture the right data, right? Identifying those gaps and filling those gaps. I think that foundation becomes very important when this kind of a transformation happens. Interesting. And then we are talking about using the right analytical processes, right, having the right kind of tools which will kind of convert these data and insights into, you know, models and uh, automated decisions. I think I think there are enough and more techniques and uh, you know uh, tools available for that particular piece. But the more the, more, the, the I think in the transformation of legacy, I think knowing what is valuable knowing what is not valuable and then getting into a transformation which makes sense from a cost perspective. I think they are very important before we get into the data science part of it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, about uh, four months back, I did a comprehensive research on this. I can share the research topics with you at Cybos in uh, here in Toronto. And uh, we had some very interesting insights on how banks are using microservices-based approach to do this kind of uh, transformation on one side and a lot more interesting insights. I'll share you this report. All of you may probably be benefited by that uh, particular report. Uh, Jay Chandran, sure, you have be been great. doing, uh, thank yeah. you for that. Uh, Jay Chandran, you have been doing uh, a lot of work around this. How has yes. your experience been from 
you know, data engineering perspective, when you are looking at legacy to digital transformation, how is that integration? How is that app modernization level working for you to get the right kind of data and also, uh, you know, churn out or uh, handpick or cherry pick the right kind of data for your requirements? Thanks, Babu. Thanks for asking this question. Actually, it resonates well with me or my bank, actually. So we are a 150 year old bank uh, operating across Asia and Africa and Middle East, uh, but headquartered in London. And we have, we operate more than 50 countries, actually. If you see in India itself, we, it is the 152nd year, I believe, in, in India. So if you take the data, right, uh, it is, we have country regulations. We have, each country has its own regulations. We cannot take the data out of uh, certain countries. We cannot have a single data source for all the programs. If you, if you look at the standard chart at, at any point of time, there will be a migration program from legacy to old, uh, legacy to the new technology. Uh, migration program will be always running for some for something else, for something so always running. So at the core, at the heart of this migration, right, we have to think what is the current latest technology and how we are going to do it, right? If you look at, if you, if you look at 10 years back, right, everything we are, in the 2000, you, as, as you, everyone know that we know we moved to the dot com, but in five years back, everyone was you know, trying to move to cloud. They said cloud first. Now, you know, we are going back saying that, you know, hybrid, keep the, um, uh, you know, keep <clears throat> what we can and then uh, move to the cloud. So now it's a hybrid culture. So now how we are doing it, right? We are, we have to adapt the country regulations also for those, you know, we are having the localized cloud and then for the countries which are open that we are having a centralized cloud. So most of the things we are moving into the cloud and earlier it was all, uh, you know, uh, business uh, driven uh, data that we had data lakes, all the data driven were having their own, uh, you know, storage. Now we are trying to, you know, centralize wherever it is possible so that we can reduce the cost and also scalability is also possible. Superb. Uh, so you have already touched upon my scalability question, which has to come in next. But before I start that, let me also introduce Sundar. Hey, Sundar. Hi. So Sundar is Hi. basically again a veteran in this sector. I have known him for what twenty plus years now. Uh, he uh, when he was in ING Vaishya Bank in uh, technology, and he has had a long journey in banking and post that in insurance. Now he's the chief risk officer at LIC. So Sundar, we are having some uh, wonderful conversations. We started off on. Uh, seamless integration and customer experience. Now we are getting into the next level of uh, how organizations are facing the challenge of modernization of the legacy systems. Uh, and you are the mother of all legacy system, LIC of India. So uh, you have seen it all. So these are some of the things that we have been talking to. While I will come to your specific question on compliance, uh, uh, since this question has already uh, taken a whole lot of uh, discussion till now, let me just hop in immediately to, uh, you know, our I just wanted to add, uh, we are also into digital transmission now. Yes. And uh, we want to be paperless on our post two years of the project. So let's see. Great. Uh, yes. Sundar. We will talk a lot more with you on this. But meantime, uh, anything, Man Mangesh, you would wish to add before I jump on to Aruch? Legacy issue is everywhere. So we are having very old customers. So our bank is not exception to that. So uh, we basically, and one unique thing is that uh, we have a two core banking system. Basically, our primary focus uh, is to give uh, services to under unserved and underserved customers. So micro banking or micro finance is our uh, major uh, domain actually so for that we are using uh, one uh, core banking where only micro banking uh, customers are being served we have a, uh, our track core banking finical for uh, liability products and uh, other secured loan products basically so like, like uh, data actually data earlier you know in india date of birth itself is not a proper and there are so many documents actually you take any proof there may be different dates for the same person, like a driving license will have a one date, other card will have a another date. Then you go with some other government card, there it will have a, these things. So it is very difficult because each system, because origin, origin, the customer uh, sometimes he update uh, through some other system, sometimes he go to the branch and he will give that uh, documents. So it is data issue basically. Data was there, but it was not consistent across the systems. 
so all banks uh, they have taken the deduplication dedupe kind of activity it's available and now uh, we can say it is uh, accurate data still sometimes we have to do the corrections but uh, unless we have a correct or proper data we cannot serve the customers because there are Absolutely. lot of things are uh, depend on this uh, date of birth i am giving just example of date of birth but there are other like purpose codes are there in banking purpose code or uh, you, you say that uh, even uh, religion also matters uh, so sometimes government has to uh, which uh, religion you are given Th- those kind of questions are uh, coming from uh, governments also being uh, uh, we are absolutely. providing services to social this thing absolutely so but then uh, this is the legacy but then we have to serve all kind of customer there are the janji customers are there chennai customers are there so we are also having we are not a exception all like big banks uh, the solutions which big banks are using same solutions we have to provide because uh, banking services are same maybe in, in a small scale but we have to provide mobile banking internet banking or upi every solutions or every every services we have to provide and we are providing basically all our digital transactions uh, percentage wise it is almost 88 by 88 89% transactions we are processing through digitally all our processes basically customer so, journeys are digitized great and, and i think your legacy of information from a public sector bank to a small finance bank you must have seen it all and done it quite a lot of it so before i come to vishal on the next question i think uh, th- thanks first of all mangesh for that uh, i would uh, ask aruj aruj from the data side perspective or from the engineering perspective or tech perspective uh, how do you see this transformation happening seamlessly uh, a quick one before we jump to the next <laughs> try to answer uh, that through um, you know from a couch based perspective i i know lot of lot of uh, uh, terms like cost modernization transformation legacy you know to obviously you know move uh, to transformation uh, to uh, digital scalability seamless volume i know it's a problem that's that's running across um, you know all the banks rather today so typically the data is there you know but it is fragmented and you know siloed across uh, when it comes from multiple lines of business uh we understand that many banks have you know typical monolithic architecture uh they have vertically scaled systems uh they do not give performance they do not give scale uh you're not able to achieve something like an active active uh you know environment um, for multiple re- uh, you know across different regions and definitely is expensive to scale and manage right so i feel the banking has evolved uh, but the future is completely different right so there are new challenges that every bank is going through today uh, many of the conversations that i've done lately you know most importantly the scale at which the transaction volumes are growing from debit card credit card loans bill payments upis uh, we do also have had discussions on integrating paytm transaction you know some of the banks have been selected to um, you know integrate paytm transactions uh, you know and it is actually overwhelming the core oracle or, or if i would rather call it or relational production nodes and the concept of creating shadow accounting etc being thought out right so the volume has grown exponentially and um, it's expected to grow even at a faster rate which is most of the banks is becoming unpredictable now uh, from a couch based perspective uh, you know uh, typically we see that that we're not trying to replace the core right uh, that's not what any no sql database and i think we not prepared not any other databases are actually prepared to replace the core so so typically uh, uh, as i mentioned we not trying to replace core uh, that's not what any no sql database would rather do today uh, it's it's kind of impossible but there's obviously a journey uh, that you need to ride on to actually replace the core the core legacy systems as well so there are two ways that we can look at it you know one is to actually replatform uh, you know and then secondly is to modernize them now when i talk about replatform and modernize that's one such kind of big effort right so we can replatform the core databases we can migrate it to couchbase move towards modernization the application uh we do have many use cases like that and we've done it for many of the customers where they were eventually on uh you know uh, oracles and memcache and I, i mean if i take that name which is amidius uh we've actually provide we we today provide uh, both persistent and ephemeral service and today we're doing up to 20 million operations per second handling about 180 plus terabytes of data simply on couchbase by replacing oracle right where in the other journey which is the modernization is a much easier uh, effort right so we sit above the legacy of oracles uh, and then we modernize so some of the core banking use cases that we are working to address are 
day and reporting to RBI, right? So I would assume that this is one of the areas that every bank is focusing on, right? So where data is still sitting on Oracle and we're extracting data from Oracle, providing day and analytics and provide the capability to run scale application. And the second use case could be mobile. So we are extracting data from multiple OLTV systems, and then we're putting it into ODS and providing a super app scenario, right? So you have, with Couchbase, you typically have both the options. Uh, and you know you don't want to touch your OLTV, we can still modernize, we can still create an ODS and extract data and coexist, but, but, but we've been doing it for many, many customers. Superb. That's a good uh, encapsulation of things. So once we have gone into the modernization and uh, transformation of this uh, journey, mm -hmm. from there, we if you go more into the customization journey, and uh, I think Arijit has already mentioned about customization, personalization, and AI in banking. If we read a, a lot about it, what is it that is very crucial when it comes to uh, doing innovations around personalization today more affordably and more effectively? Okay, this is something, Vishal, uh, let us start with you first on what is your thought been around this area? See, when it comes to personalization, you know, I'd break it down in terms of uh, usage of AI and personalizing, say you personalize the journey for a customer, you personalize the product for the customer. What is essential or uh, typically what is required for a right model to work is data, you know, which is processing the data in processing the information in the right manner and creating the right models. So in today's world, it is critical that we analyze, we have the right data set and we analyze the data uh, before we even start the journey of personalizing it for the customer. Now, there are various methods that we do, you know, we do uh, depending on the requirement. We do sentiment analysis, we do predictive analysis, we do um, automation in terms of uh, repetitive tasks, streamlining the repetitive tasks. So, depending on uh, the journey of a customer, you know, uh, uh, we use the models as such. Uh, in our case, in our scenario, being an NBFC, what is critical for us? Uh, the criticality is, you know, uh, ensuring that we provide the loan to the right customer, which is initially taking the KYC, and then, you know, doing, doing an underwriting process. In all these areas, we can personalize by using the tools in terms of the automation, in terms of uh, not asking too many questions from the customer, but still fetching the right information for the customer, you know, uh, while doing the KYC. Now, also, when I come back to the underwriting process, we automate the, the scenarios in such a way that we have the banking details of the customer. We have uh, the, the the right scoring of the customer and we arrive at the right uh, uh, values as such for the customer. So this, if, if everything is sued in the right manner, we are able to give the right experience for the customer and deliver in the right manner. So that's how uh, I would take my take would be from the NBC perspective. Superb, superb. Uh, we could not cover a much on for the NBFC perspective in the earlier question, but this is a good uh, thing to start off with. Uh, Kesha, uh, you have been working from more from the business side. What is your perspective, especially when it comes to customization uh, and its increasing use of AI in banking? When we talk about customization with respect to simplifying the processes is one aspect. Uh, AI, see. Customization through AI is very specifically for uh, personalization of data for the customer. Okay. Uh, we have a set of legacy platforms which we are trying to acclimatize and customize to cater to us uh, in a personalized sense to the customer. Now, there are many strategic advantages to it. One, because AI data, AI driven data analytics. Uh, will help you understand customer preferences and behaviors. One. Second, you have a personalized marketing campaigns that you can drive and the product recommendations also go in such a manner. Uh, the third piece would be the predictive analytics to anticipate what the customer will need. 
and how the offers can be more pro, uh, provided in a more proactive solutions now how do you that is the kind of a customization processes that we take at the back end through ai how do you cater it to the customers i mean what are the ways that you can do it are through ai chatbots virtual assistants um uh, through multi uh, vernacular ai chatbots who can tailor it to uh, tailor a financial advi uh, advice to the lo lowest uh, what you all cater of the customer base that we look at even for the financial inclusion pieces we have machine learning models where the dynamic pricing and the personalized loan offerings can be created uh, that is more on a specific uh, on a retail asset side now with someone was mentioning out there that we have a increasing number of retail transactions which we have seen the upi has driven the customer base from a, a very a thousands to now on a billion scale right now how do you figure out real time fraud detections so ai helps you customize those bits also i mean uh, the fraud prevention tailored fraud prevention for a customer profile or a customer segment is one aspect of customization that you can look at uh there are definite robo advisors which are which we have seen in the market who have been coming and uh, demoing to us more on the personalized investment strategies that those are the personalized finance managers so there are a lot of ways you can do a customization uh, with ai in banking there are a lot of ways you can uh, tailor it and uh, present it to the customer or deliver it to the customer I mean, there are innovations are ongoing at the, as we speak. It's an evolution. So I know that's I know. about my take. Yeah. So I, I can I can add to that, uh, Babu. So what um, Keshav just mentioned, right? So one of the authentic way of uh, building data science models and data science models are built on the historical data by seeing the historical behavior of the customer, uh, and and try to find out the look like look alike customers for the predictions right so i have seen this set of customers has taken home loan so i am trying to find out who are the same set of i mean same group of customers have not taken i will approach that to the data science model right data science output as a but but often we have seen that whether that is successful but if we add the customer need into it rather than what product wants to push if we go towards what customers need by capturing various actions that customer those customers are taking in various mediums right it could be app it could be digi digital medium it could be through customer with chat uh, in some uh, social media forum uh, by collecting all this data right we can find out what a particular customer need and if we can feed that data into our data science model right so then data science model will not look into they look alike they also look one of the major aspect will be what customers have searched recently what customers is looking for and from that angle we will make an offer to them so that's on the how to select the customers and while presenting it to customer right they are also ai can and personalization can place a, a very big role so there are for Singapore market, for example, it's a multi cultural, multi, uh, you know, country, um, uh, you know, uh, people are there, right? So what might be a good content for a person who, with Chinese background or it cannot be a good content for a person with Japanese background, right? Similarly yeah. for India, for uh, for other countries, Vietnam, right? So there are multilingual, multicultural people are there. So there we have identified that which are the uh, uh, color, content, um, a mix of everything for particular geo, you know, geographies, right? And then we have created a repository where on the runtime, by seeing the customer demographics, the selection of offer will pick up that kind of template, that kind of background, that kind of, you know, uh, messaging, right? Uh, for the end customers and then push it across. So that the chance of, customer understanding that and recognizing it and, and going for that product is, is always higher. So that's how we have tried to personalize both the picking up, choosing the customers, choosing the product for them, and also how to present that product to the customers so that they will like it. Superb. Superb. I think uh, that's pretty, pretty and interesting and exhaustive kind of uh, talk around customization there. And then when we come from customization, to that of uh, compliance. There is a lot more that is happening around the area of compliance. And that is where our friends like Sundar has a big role to play. And uh, 
I would uh, also like to take the question on scalability and agility with Jayachandran later. But Sundar, coming to the compliance angle of it, what is your thought around compliance? How is emerging compliance challenges in AI-driven financial services now? I think uh, what we've heard so far and uh, even LIC is trying to achieve is customer convenience, flexibility, understanding customer needs, and ensuring systems uh, are able to uh, cope to the customer needs and requirements in future. When you do all that, uh, of course, you would then deal with data of customer. And one of the most emerged requirement, the act that is already done uh, last year and rules are expected soon, is the privacy requirement. How do you ensure that you seek consent of the customer uh, when you store its data and when you give the data to third partners, specialists, uh, which specialist you are passing on the data, what kind of data you are passing, how you have sought the consent. The consent has to be very specific. It can be generalized tick in the form. Uh, earlier, you know, we used to tick several things in the form and say customer has ticked and signed the form and we are compliant. But that's no more valid now. You will have to really deal with the privacy requirement of the customer. Customer says, no, I don't. I want my data to be deleted in six months time or nine months time. You would have to ensure that it is deleted. You also have to ensure how is the customer data handled, to which processor you are passing on the data and for what purpose. And so you will have to explain to the customer in terms of maybe a SMS, in terms of an email, in terms of a WhatsApp, in terms of a uh, update to its account and portal, and many other forms which customer chooses. So the convenience, flexibility is very high, and capturing data beforehand is very important, and understanding the customer need is also important. Now, there could be a regulatory requirement which says, no, you must keep the data of customer or at least KYC of customer as per uh, you know PMLA, uh, say up to 10 years after the policy also has matured. Then I'll have to explain to the customer, look, you want the data to be deleted, but I have this PMLA requirement. And therefore, I have to keep your KYC for 10 more years. So please allow me to keep the uh, your record for 10 more years, but I would ensure the data is encrypted and used only for regulatory purposes and only by a few people. And you have to seek a very specific cons consent from uh, the customer in that manner. So this is this is very important uh, when you look at privacy as one of the compliance requirements. Other there are many other compliance requirements uh, that you know you have uh, in terms of the regulators uh, articulating many requirements. You would have the uh, IT Act, uh, Information Technology Act of various countries impacting the requirement. So you have to meet all those requirements. Apart from of course the privacy requirement that has just emerged, uh, of course. Uh, other than India, you would have, you have had GDPR and then uh, GDPR has uh, been well implemented now. But when you look at the fines that have been levied by GDPR regulators, it's been huge. And so yeah. we, we wouldn't know what would happen to India, uh, what kind of uh, travel path the Indian companies have. Everybody is waiting for the rules to unfold. And it's going to be a last minute effort. Uh, GDPR gave two years time. And uh, last six months were only spent uh, in you know ensuring that everybody is GDPR compliant. Similarly, in India, unfortunately, we are all waiting for the rules to come, and uh, nobody is uh, preparing in advance. There's a lot that of is, lot of escalations to the piece. government that... and regulators that go slow on us. So this That's... is the picture on compliance, you know. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. In fact, foreseeing the unseen compliance things is. Uh, one of the most important aspect of uh, this thing. Any other opinions from the uh, banking or NBFC leaders uh, on this around compliance before we jump on to Arup and I have a very interesting specific questions to them, Arup and Anish. But before that, any interesting banking and uh, or NBFC perspectives around Even The Reserve Bank has come out with a very detailed circular uh, about what are the IT infrastructure requirements, cyber security requirements. Cyber security requirements have been unfolded by all the three regulators, RBI, SEB, and IIDAI. And uh, in fact, they're following international standards now, NIST. So the requirements have gone up. And so the expenditure and the investments on cyber security every year is compounding. Uh, forget uh, marginal rise, you know. 
So there are a lot of requirements now in terms of encryption of data, in terms of uh, storage of data, in terms of protection of data, in terms of confidentiality requirements being met. And regulators are not even uh, allowing uh, players to launch digital initiatives. If first you comply security requirements, then we could look at digital initiatives. So even big banks have been uh, asked to hold on uh, with their uh, business, you know, uh, said that first you comply, uh, meet security requirements, ensure data is stored properly, then you go ahead. So that is so the, that is the biggest. Of... That is the biggest whip that has been cracked on most of the banks, especially from the yes. uh, regulatory yes. perspective, and uh, that is coming out heavy, including the PTM story, which has come. Yes, a lot of other stories. So. The... Uh, into the picture. Any other banking perspective before I move on to the technologies here and then I would come to data engineering where I want uh, Jayachandran to talk. Uh, we will just move a little very quick now. We are just hard pressed on time. Can we just quickly, uh, yeah. any banker wanting to share? Yeah, just a couple of points on the compliance side while Sundar had given some uh, very uh, detailed and uh, you know useful information on the compliance aspects relating to uh, you know, data security, so on and so forth. I think this one is not on us as yet, but I think we are entering that arena where there are going to be compliance oversight on how we are modeling. I mean, it's already there in some of the developed economies. What data you can use for modeling, what you can't use, how how much explainable can your, uh, you know, model, how explainable should the models be and all of that. See, for example, there is, I mean, uh, we do utilize geography, we do use uh, demographics, and uh, we use a lot of these parameters rather freely now. And we, the only thing which, you know, determines whether a parameter is being used is whether it differentiates risk or not, you know, from a perspective of application scorecard. I think very soon we'll enter a scenario where we may not be able to use all the parameters, even if they uh, rank order in terms of risk. The geography, we may need to use a bit sensitively. Uh, similarly, gender we may start. We may need to use sensitively. So I think we should slowly, on our own volition, see how we can actually make some of our models, uh, you know, compliance shock proof, so that it doesn't hit us very badly when it's going to spring on us. Hundred percent. I absolutely agree with you. I'm sure uh, DBS, uh, uh, which is being regulated by one of the most uh, uh, forward-looking regulators in Singapore is definitely already working on this because I have heard a lot of interesting stuff around this compliance that they have been working around. So these are some of the things where already some work is already happening. But I, I while I would love to have a lot more insights from uh, DBS that Aruj has got some wonderful uh, initiatives or uh, insights into fraud management and customization of frauds that has been happening. Aruj, quickly, in a minute or two, can you just encapsulate what you have experienced in this? You know, the bank uh, deploys a generative AI system that continuously monitors and analyzes, you know, transaction data. And the AI assesses transaction based on patterns of known fraudulent activities, unusual transaction sizes, geographical locations, how often that you know transaction has gone through. So we have many such use cases, uh, you know, for fraud and risk uh, globally as well as in India. So globally, we are working with FICO, uh, which is Falcon, uh, again a product for fraud risk, which secures sixty to seventy percent of the transactions globally. And of course, Wells Fargo, et cetera, right? But I would like to highlight one of the use cases which we have just about landed here in India. I mean, we've been working in collaboration with them for quite some time, which is the company named Vibmo, okay? And they have a platform called Trident, uh, you know, in India, which uses Couchbase extensively. Uh, and I'm assuming Keshav being, you know, of course, agreeing to that, uh, one of the users as well uh, for Trident. So uh, Vibmos basically fraud risk management, you know, it's a payment security solution used across 80% of the banks in India, uh, including some of the largest bank in both the public as well as the private sector. So it identifies potential fraudulent transactions, real-time payments happening at sub-second speeds with the help of Couchbase, right? Uh, so what was the biggest challenge which we were trying to solve for them? So obviously they had credit card, clients required secure, you know, they wanted to do transaction rapidly, adhering to strict SLS because there is obviously, uh, you know, penalties that are attached to it if you're not able to achieve that. 
right? And as Vibmo grew, uh, they actually, uh, its outdated database and in-memory systems couldn't deliver the high availability and subsequent response. And they wanted to meet these critical performance demands from their customers. So what we obviously, they switched over to Couchbase. Uh, we provided them scalability, reliability, most importantly, the fast response times, because extremely important in an FRM scenario. And of course, security, right? Meeting the compliances as well. And, uh, you know, storing transaction profiling data in memory for real time profiling suspicious, uh, you know, uh, you know, aligning all across the suspicious, uh, you know, entities like credit card numbers and mobile numbers. What they've achieved today in terms of the numbers that I would rather want to mention is they've, they've got they do about four to five million real time payment transactions per day with about 50 milliseconds to one second response time. And that's and they're they're exponentially growing, you know, with their with their space in India. Uh, obviously, we significantly boosted their performance. They scale up quickly in the in the times of spikes uh, when they experience it. And today, they are with eighty percent of the banks across. So there's a small use case that I wanted to share and leave it with everybody today. Anish, you want to quickly share something on the AI front when we were talking? You know, we were talking about knowing your customer as a as a nutshell. And two areas: one is the campaigns and the uh, personalized offers that we give customers. Second is the FRM. So Aru just given uh, the details of FRM, how we do it, and what, where AI comes into the picture. And, and uh, Sundar sir was also mentioning about the complaints. So where we can help as as a database uh, with the multi-model database that we are, where we can help is. See, when we, you don't want to push your personalized information, whatever, you need AI to work, you need to pass data. But then you cannot pass every data because of the compliance requirements. So what you create is a scope in your system where your data is managed inside the scope and then you pass only the relevant information to the AI. So kind of a rag architecture, but in a different perspective um, uh, to be specific. So that is something that we, uh, as, as a Couchbase database, as a database we have, and we have a vector search where we fit in into the architecture, the larger architect picture of a rag architecture where you can specify your scope and your data remains in your system and only the relevant information or le relevant vectors going to the AI. That's one thing. Second is the campaign management, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, when you want to know a customer, when you want to pass a specific type of campaigns or offers or deals with a customer, you need to know the customer where the data is in different silos. So customer 360 or a customer profile is again where we can actually come in as, as a technology. A uh, distributed database like Couchbase can come in and create a customer profile where your mobile application your AI application, your campaign management systems, and every system which needs to see a customer as a complete entity can consume from. We have implemented that in many banks, many other entities like LinkedIn, we have a customer profile system running on Couchbase. So customer profile system is also another strength that we can bring to the table as a database. Superb. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Anish. Uh, now, quickly, let me come to Jay Chandran. Jay Chandran, uh, we have been, you spoke, uh, touched upon the scalability issue uh, mm. on managing scalability and agility in complex uh, data uh, environment. And uh, what kind of approaches in technologies are uh, organization adopting to navigate these challenges? We are doing currently in the Stand Chat Bank. Actually, if you ask me scalability and agility, I would like, I would like to add one more thing, which is called resilience. Without resilience, these two will not work, actually. Uh, what we are doing is scalability. If you ask anyone what is how we are doing scalability, they will tell, okay, we are going cloud or we are going private cloud and we can, you know, uh, get up any missions anytime. But without resiliency, this will not work. What we are doing currently is basically for each uh, data center or each application should have an in-country uh, disaster recovery. That is the old one that everyone is having. Almost you know, every organization follows on. But what we are doing is we are having a disaster recovery in the another country so that even if the for the global application if one entire country goes down then we are getting an up running in the application from the other country so that there is a replica of data in four places only within the country there are two places and then the another country we are having a two places this is the architecture design that we are putting in place now basically that is the one that we are doing most for agility because the application will never go down then the users can access the application 24 by 7 because we are having the clients across the globe there will be a sun, Sunday we cannot access from India. We, we, it's a holiday for us. We don't worry whether it's a Sunday, it's an application up and, up and running. But in the, in the Middle East, Sunday is the working day. So we cannot put a change, global change on a particular time. And uh, so now this will help us for you. That's what you know, we are doing currently. Superb. In fact, uh, in North America, there is a mm. recent regulation that has come mm. around uh, resilience where mm. organizations are supposed to 
uh, have certain tiers of resilience already embedded into the overall architecture of the organization by the regulator. And I was doing an interesting cloud study yesterday uh, where they, uh, the overall cloud picture globally has been demarketed into which organization is being used mostly by fintech for products, which, uh, which is used mostly for services and application, and the third one around uh, which is used mostly as a backup. According to a lot of this research, Google has been, in at least in Canada, been used mm -hmm. by most of the companies as a backup for, uh, uh, you know, uh, the AWS or to the Azure. Yes. So each one has been now become a specialist in some different area or the other. Mangesh and Vishal, uh, quickly, if both of you can take... Uh, a minute each or a couple of minutes each on emerging, uh, uh, you know, on synergizing multi-technology environments for business optimization. How have you been looking at multi-technology environments in optimizing the business? Something like what I spoke right now. Uh, how has been your experience, Mangesh? The criteria basically, uh, it should be a, uh, the interoperability should be there in multi-technology kind of environment because uh, that plays a very uh, critical uh, load and then a critical uh, factor and then uh, basically that, that is one and actually like i could not uh, got this answer last one minute i was uh, having some chat with uh, my boss so this is one thing basically multi technology we are facing this uh, challenge and then uh, there is uh, uh, somewhere we are saying that we should do the vendor uh, consolidation. That is also there is a direction that we should have a, a few vendors so that uh, we can have a, uh, a technology from the same uh, OEM. Those kind of uh, vendor. One way it is we we are consolidating the vendors, thing, and in uh, uh, in other way uh, in multi technology uh, we have to see that how uh, different system or different uh, technology talk to each other. So that uh, there is a seamless integration between uh, this technology and the technology should not be obstacle for scale scalability and uh, interoperability. That is what. Uh... Thanks, Mangesh. That was a crisp, concise and a very interesting uh, set of uh, answers that you provided. Vishal, any thoughts from you on multi-technology environments or on, uh, on the area of compliance or scalability as such? A thought comes into my mind. Just last week, uh, we had a Microsoft incident, you know, that yeah. brings us to a situation or, or just a thinking thought process that we can't rely on one particular entity. And uh, multi-technology, uh, in a way, answers or solves that problem, although that's actually a reality of the today's world as well. Uh, from the hindsight, uh, see, there are a lot of types of technologies one legacy systems uh, new age technologies uh, fintech solutions so uh, but the answer or the way i look at it is still the fundamental you know whether when i'm integrating two technologies or two different systems or when i'm uh, if i want to solve a problem and i i have uh, i can solve it by using one system or implementing one system or multiple systems uh, what's the use case, you know, uh, how beneficial it is going to be for uh, my organization or my uh, customer. So these are the things that I, I uh, fundamentally we, we think about before we uh, architect or design the entire system, you know, uh, be it a single system or multiple system uh, together. Now, while we work in on work on multi technology, what other things that we also take care of is the data. You know how the data is moving between the systems, and what essentially is going to be the source of truth for the data. At the end of the day, we are a regulated organization. Uh, the industry is regulated, so what really matters is where the data has been stored, how the data has been processed, regardless of you know what technology is being used. So that is something that we consider. And the second is, uh, the last one I would cover is the security. You know, how are we encrypting the data at the rest while uh, rest as well as in the transit? 
Are we tokenizing the information? Are we ensuring the APIs that we are building or the microservices that we are building? They are also uh, developed or built uh, with the security in mind. So these are the things that we take care of or consider uh, uh, in, in, in today's world, day and age. Interesting. That's a very good uh, perspective about putting together all the pieces in ensuring that uh, it becomes much more seamless in this entire journey. Uh, excellent. Uh, Sundar, before we jump out uh, for the closing remark, you have had experience of converting uh, Reliance Nippon into a 360 degree with the help of AI analytics into fraud risk management. Uh, uh, or uh, in terms of fraud analytics, running analytics as one of the uh, first insurance companies to do that. And now you are working on re-architecting or uh, architecting the digital journey of, uh, rely of LIC. Uh, how has your experience been when you combine both these things? And these are all gigantic organizations now. So what is your experience in putting these things together? What is the reading uh, from the uh, macro perspective? It comes down to customer first. You know? If organizations really mean that customer should be first and you give priority to customer's needs, customer's uh, requirements, uh, pre process, people, technology fall in line uh, in a cohesive way. Uh, when, I, when I achieved what I achieved in uh, Reliance, in fact, it was very initial. Uh, even the industry, many people, nobody had ventured into what I had done because I used to cancel policies after issuing the policy. I said, nobody does like this, Sundar. This is what I was told. It was in 2012. And I said, uh, let's check with IRDA because, you know, I was very clear that the policy document contained the clause which said that if you have fraudulent information that is submitted by the customer, you have every right to cancel the policy. And in fact, they said you, need, you even need not refund premium. We used to refund the premium. But they used to say that even you don't have to do that. So that's the kind of support I got from IIDA. Then my CEO also was supportive because in certain regions and certain products, you had a excess over actual. So whatever the actuarial statistically you say, okay, predict so much would be the claim. We were excess in some parts of the country, some parts of the region, some parts of the occupation, some parts of the products. So I could give about, get about nine or eight parameters, which regions are bad, which occupations are bad, and they just say business. They don't specify the occupation clearly. And then which uh, uh, policies are bad. The guy will never exist. Uh, there will be no proper photograph of the customer. You can make out, you know, it's a mob photo. Then you would have problems. So there are eight or nine problems that I could identify straight away without using analytics. Then I used analytics with combos. Uh, the analytics team worked on it and did a six months back study. Then they found that the parameters, eight or nine that I gave, became 34. And then slowly, slowly, a big analytics team came about. And today, Reliance Nippon is in the top 10, you know. Uh, and this in the 10, less than 10 percent is the early claim. It used to be at 35 percent, 35, 36. From that, 34, 32, 28, 24, 29, 18, 14. Today, they are at six or eight or nine in the top, top part of the industry quartile. So that is the kind of, at the same time, you have to ensure customers are not rejected, customers are not uh, impacted. So what we used to do was post-issuance of the policy, we migrated that to pre-issuance of policy. So today, from underwriting team, you get packets, uh, 1,000 packets of 5,500 or something like that, which are suspicious by using parameters of analytics. Then you go about and investigate them. Now, the return on this is very high. If you investigate every policy, you will go bankrupt. Because you have to spend a lot of money. I used to spend, <laughs> I used to spend about 50, 60 lakhs and save about 70, 60 crores per year. Per, per time, you know, whatever time it was. So it made sense. And it was going to be quick also. At the same time, you have to ensure that you actually pay 98, 99% of your claim. Because if you don't pay 98, 99% of your claim, then you are not looked at properly. It is a reputation risk. So you have to combine all this and then we migrated the post to free using analytics. And today, analytics have gone beyond 34 parameters there. It's so robust. And uh, they give you exactly what could go wrong. And then you ensure. So the results are very good. Super. So same thing LIC is trying to do now. 
digital transformation bcg is there we have at karni who is doing transformation of the agents uh, many many parties are involved infosys is there in system integration so uh, we would achieve what we need to achieve in two years time is virtually paperless again very important and analytics will be used along with the data lake but as we speak today also there are systems which are there robotics is there there is a uh, portal there is a lot of customer conveniences also there but it's silo based now what will happen in two years time is to be integrated so you need you need all departments to come together you can't do it alone it's very uh, difficult so a sales force also uh, cooperated initially sales force was very upset when i did what i did then i said you take the policy you come back to me with customer data if you come back with customer data i will ensure the policy is issued and not cancelled nobody came back because the data was so accurate interesting and one of the most important thing uh, you know in this uh, is you have to trade between the uh, cost and the kind of result yeah, that reputation with. yeah i yes. am working yeah. with one very interesting underwriting analytics startup here uh, who presented to me two days before in one of the thai things i would share that with you very very interesting sure, sure. to on underwriting with ai great arup and uh, anish uh, either of you Uh, i just wanted your perspective before we close on synergizing this multi technology environments for optimizing uh, these businesses using ai uh, any perspectives from your side on how you have been doing a quick one great babu i can i can maybe take that anish you want to add please please to uh, so see uh, i i maybe just want to throw some light over what couchbase really does uh, from a capability standpoint as well right so so that there are a lot of challenges today uh, which which obviously depend on a lot of factors you know so with all of the uh, details that um, you know that was shared today i mean it it was clearly evident that you know you need a database that that could do a lot more than just uh, being a purpose built database for a particular use case right so with the biggest challenges we see today all of it require a mobile app you require to be compliant you need fraud at the edge you need ml at the edge you need customer profiling interface you cannot build etls across data services get yourself into a complex deployments uh, definitely need a nimble database which is flexible from a data model and familiar with your existing environments as well right I, we understand that you are heavily invested into legacy databases as well right uh the other challenge of course we do understand that legacy application runs on relational databases in this case you you choose to you know throw a lot more physical virtual resources you know you're escalating your cost uh, in all the ways and then of course you're using multiple data services across different technologies and you know dealing with escalating managing you know those costs as well so just just to give you a little more highlight on couchbase up so you know couchbase uh, you know we, we we've actually gained a significant momentum uh, you know in india and globally uh, you know with streamlining data strategy uh, amid increasing cost of managing the scale and deploying multiple complex technologies to cater to basic functional requirements of an application and today when people are talking about real time we do understand that how important is oltp and olap capabilities within a single database so as a product uh, you know we merger between two companies so we have an built in memory first architecture we have capabilities beyond json kv relational capabilities as well of biggest investors investment was into sql queries right so we understand that you've invested 30 years uh you know learning implementing sql queries in your environment and we understand so we we bet on json at that time but yet we still built a query in across on prem mobile and cloud time series uh you know analytics in the same uh, engine columnar store eventing mobile so that it cut across you know a lot of those capabilities with xcr capabilities coming into the picture as well so as a platform we are available both on prem as well as on the cloud uh having the similar source code ensuring that for a bank also we have a platform not just just for uh just for the digital natives rather i would call it or people you know companies who are born in the cloud rather you know uh we are investing into both the platforms where we giving you all of these capabilities available on prem uh, i'll let any maybe if you want to have some closing notes and then we can push it off to bab excellent that was a quick encapsulation i know you cannot put all your capabilities within 5 minutes in a statement but uh, that is a good one for everyone to uh, take it everyone uh, other than anish and uh, of course aruj who have already encapsulated a quick one minute uh, maybe from you mangesh first and uh, then we will take from others also just one one minute any 
take back that uh, takeaway that you have had today interesting it was a basically interesting session a lot of uh, actually see the objective is to uh, give a seamless service to customer whether it is an internal customer or external customer we have to automate the process so that uh, we can provide better service to the customer and like new uh, we discuss on multi technology so a lot of new technologies are there and uh, thanks to our regulator and uh, our co means co competition in the market so we are uh, forced to or uh, willingly unwillingly I, i should not use unwillingly word but the every bank is uh, every organization is uh, going for new technology which is beneficial for them and uh, they if you don't implement a new technology or if you don't provide the customer better customer service you will be out from the market that is the thing uh, uh, this is one take take away regarding compliance and uh, uh, risk basically because uh, when we discuss with uh, uh, new technology uh, like uh, in the board or in the top management so first thing comes in the mind uh, like security whether it is secure because everybody worried about the cyber security threats lot of uh, news are coming or so sometimes uh, it happens that uh, security budgets they are uh, taking more importance than the business uh, budget so that things are happening but then uh, uh, we have to see uh, uh, balance between uh, both the things so that customer should get a proper service customer should get a secure service and customer should get a seamless and timely service that is the mantra of uh, absolutely and an affordable service because it should also be good on your pockets Uh, yes. for the organization shareholders and for the customer sundar is smiling when we speak about tech, uh, you know uh, security because he has been a security professional and the head of isaka for india for some time so i can see that smile in his face and we have always been discussing this uh, topic quite often right uh, quick one from you arijit yeah sure while the data uh, you know is growing exponentially and we are the usage of data equally growing exponentially uh, through it uh, be it ai ml data science or or various you know um, ways the risk and compliance is very very important banking is that service where people um, hard earned money is saved so something uh, some kind of you know cyber secure crime etc should not wipe out people's lives savings right so so while we are exploring data as a greater and larger space the security and compliance is very very important and uh, to be looked upon so yeah i think that's my remark excellent uh, what is the quick take away from you vishal so uh, the first thing is all the questions were very nicely embedded you know one after the other so it was really amazing session my experience was amazing thank you very much uh, babu for this and from the insights perspective all of us brought on to the table you know in terms of the challenges we, which people are facing are quite similar in terms of how the legacy systems uh, are there and how we are embarking ourselves on a digital journey and then you know how we are taking care of the compliances and the security so uh essentially entire journey of a data is discussed today so this is really great thank you very much super thank you thank you very much uh, how about you jay chandran any quick uh, tip from your side yeah thanks for arranging the session babu it's really good and then i got you know a lot of insights from other leaders also here one quick uh, one quick take away for me is you know uh, should be client or customer should be at the heart any technology be it a ai or cloud or anything it should serve the client you should not start from the technology and what what we are going to serve for the client but it should start from the uh, client and then it should come towards the technology that's the take away you know i always say superb superb that's a great thing everyone is echoing the client first and everything centered around that client we know a quick one from you anything interesting you want to share as a one line sure in fact yeah sure in fact i'll take off from what jaitendran had just mentioned you know giving an example of the client first you know my father was also from the banking industry of course i mean he's retired now he retired probably 20 years back uh, he was he was in a public sector bank he said around 25 30 years back he was in a clerical grade at that stage right not even an officer got clerical stage but still he said he had the pass to take a call you know when a big client approaches him who with whom he you know the bank had a great relations he has issued some check 
and he is expecting some check in but there is no money in the account so when the client comes in and if he is a good client my father could pass the check without the money in the account with a oral assurance that he'll put the money back probably by evening or probably you know the check is going to come in right that was when none of this i mean that was the dog eared ledger and uh, typewriter kind of uh, stage today we moved to computers we are talking of ai and ml but because of this we are not able to give that kind of flexibility to our employees or that kind of uh, you know service to the customer right it has become too much process oriented so there's no way you are going to pass the money till the uh, amount is actually lying in the account so this so sometimes it makes me when a wonder we've gone so far ahead in terms of technology and analytics and data science have we really proceeded at that pace when it comes to customer service great excellent and i would like to conclude with the take away thank you very much uh, vinod for that uh, encapsulation and i absolutely uh, agree with you that ultimately whether it is today or then customer was always the most important piece and uh, and all this ai is ultimately built on human intelligence uh, so uh, absolutely agree with you keshav a uh, quick uh, you know crisp uh, uh, encapsulation from your side i will not add on to uh, what everyone has said i think uh, they've covered everything very, very well uh, the good takeaway about the session was uh, for me the compliance piece the sundaram what he is mentioned the, the way whatever dreams we may chase there is always a boundary which the regulator will put in i think that was a very uh, nicely made uh, what you call put across statement which i will take away for today because uh, as a digital banking we start we think only on innovation but then there's always a trade off when it comes to when we go and present it to the uh, regulators so that's one good takeaway that i will keep in mind so sundar you have some very interesting uh, uh, one liner closure before we close the no, i think uh, i totally agree with all the comments and uh, what i would like to add is i think we should also look at behavioral aspects of the systems and uh, that would probably give the flexibility to the banking clerk i i quite agree with uh, the statements made that you know what has happened is the front end person is not so knowledgeable now when you look at him i remember about 20 years back when i went to hdfc financial institution they approved my aussie loan in 10 minutes they just had a look at me look at my papers just 10 minutes those two people signed off and approved my loan i was so impressed i mean that kind of judgmental ability we we need to have and therefore that can come only through behavioral systems and behavioral systems would also need to be added to the ai and uh, you know you you get quick insight into what's the customer is about and uh, should have the flexibility to decide absolutely you know dhananjay tambe he said you know uh, the way a shamu in the village is given a loan by the uh, money lender by seeing his face and asking one question kab tak paisa dega and uh, the kind of result he gives within that one minute is what makes that shamu go to the money lender then come to a bank which will look into 5000 papers Absolutely. how can you Absolutely. bring in that quality into the decision making using ai analytics data or whatever technology that you can do ultimately it is a shamu who should be happy and that is the customer centricity that we are all talking about thank you very much everyone for making this a very lively session i think we have had a really great participation from all of you vishal jaychandran vinod keshav aruj mangesh and uh, arijit and anish and sundar of course so uh, i think we have had a great session